Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last installment of our blockbuster, first ever Bill of Rights Constitutional Book Fair. A big round of applause to all of you for having stayed with us through these remarkably substantive and engaging hours. I'm so proud of you, our great NCC members and audience who are so hungry for constitutional education that you have set aside uh, Bill of Rights Day to hear the best thinkers and really educate yourselves. And we're so lucky to have you at the center. Uh, those of you, uh, who are watching on C-SPAN who don't happen to be members of the Constitution Center can become members by going to our website, constitutioncenter.org, signing up and getting access to our incredible videos and podcasts and programs and symposia, and you'll have access to the best nonpartisan constitutional debate in the country every week and every day. Uh, I am, uh, I've done my duty with three moderated panels, and I'm going to turn over this last one to a dear friend and of the center who's just a superb uh, moderator. I'm going to introduce him in a sec, but let me just say to our C-SPAN audience, if you are just tuning in, I'm Jeff Rosen, the head of the National Constitution Center, which is the only institution in America <laughs> chartered by Congress. Okay, everyone, you can do it together. To disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. Okay. So that's what the Constitution Center is. We've just opened up this phenomenal new exhibit displaying one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. Who has managed to see it during the breaks? Um, it's, it's so exciting, isn't it? Can we have a round of applause for the Bill of Rights? <laughs> it's just, just so really, really honored to be able to display this priceless document along with a rare declaration of independence and the Constitution for the next three years. So come see it in Philadelphia and online. And tweet your questions to at Constitution Center, Constitution CTR, using the hashtag NCC Bill of Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, we have together traveled from an exploration of the roots and contemporary meaning of the First Amendment to the debate between Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke, to a vigorous debate between the libertarian and the democratic vision of the Constitution. And now we are going to hear from the author of an acclaimed new biography of the Chief Justice who brought it all together and established the Supreme Court as a strong and co-equal branch of government and also solidified the power that we've just been talking about in the last session of judicial review. It wasn't obvious before Marbury versus Madison that independent courts had the power to strike down laws that conflicted with the Constitution. Although many assume that the power existed and you could say that it's implicit in the Federalist Papers, in particular in Federalist 78, it took Marshall's opinion in Marbury versus Madison to establish that power unequivocally, and we are going to learn about the great Chief Justice, his vision, and his battles to define America. Uh, the book is written by Harlow Giles Unger, who is a veteran journalist, broadcaster, educator, historian, and former distinguished visiting fellow in American history at George Washington's Mount Vernon. He's appeared frequently on the History Channel and on our favorite channel, C-SPAN spoken extensively and is the author of three works on early American history and 10 biographies of the Founding Fathers, including John Hancock, George Washington, and John Quincy Adams. The new book is John Marshall, The Chief Justice Who Saved the Nation. And moderating our final discussion is Judge David Wecht, a great friend of the center and mine, and you are gonna be in very capable hands with Judge Wecht. He's served on the Superior Court of Pennsylvania since 2012. Before that, he was a trial judge on the Court of Common Pleas, and he uh, has uh, presided over important cases. He's been an administrative judge, and he's just incredibly thoughtful, a lover of the Constitution, and a magnificent moderator. Please join me in welcoming Harlow Unger and Judge David Wecht. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, in front of such a wonderful audience with such a distinguished scholar and author who has uh, given us a, a fantastic new book about the great Chief Justice John Marshall. 
and the book is subtitled The Chief Justice Who Saved the Nation. So in the short time we have, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Unger is going to give you all some insights onto some of the contributions uh, that Justice Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall gave us, although with only an hour program, um, a scholar like Mr. Unger can only begin to clear his throat about this subject before the curtain comes down. So uh, <clears throat> let's get right to it. I, I, I suppose the first question um, that I, I would put to you, uh, Mr. Unger, is uh, why John Marshall and, and why now? Well, John Marshall uh, did indeed save the nation. There's a great deal of interest in the Founding Fathers, and I think John Marshall uh, probably is most important of the Founding Fathers after George Washington himself. Uh, George Washington helped create the nation, but John Marshall, as Supreme Court Chief Justice, the first effective Chief Justice, he was the fourth Chief Justice, but he was the first effective one, uh, used uh, the court uh, to defend the nation against potential tyranny uh, by the executive and judicial branches of government. Uh, the Constitution is a very vague document and gave uh, almost all powers to the House of Representatives, we the people. We, uh, the House of Representatives is the only body elected by, directly by the people themselves. Uh, the Senate was appointed by uh, the various state legislatures at the time. Uh, the president uh, was elected by the uh, college, electoral college, uh, who themselves were appointees of the state legislatures. And the judiciary, the third branch of government, was simply a, a court of appeals. Uh, it had no power. It had power to hear appeals of, of cases from lower courts and either uphold or, or uh, uh, deny the uh, decisions of the lower courts. Chief Justice Marshall stepped in at a time when uh, Washington had just died and the successor founding fathers, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, uh, all, uh, all of them comrades at one point, either comrades at the, at the uh, Continental Congress and the Declaration of Independence or comrades in, in battle in the case of, of uh, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, they were all clawing at Washington's fallen mantle. They all wanted to be president. And Jefferson, of course, uh, won in, uh, in 1800 and immediately dissolved the Supreme Court, uh, rammed a, a new Judiciary Act through Congress, which sent all the justices uh, riding circuit for two years. So the Supreme Court didn't meet for two years. Adams, in his last four years of office, had rammed through laws, uh, the famous uh, Alien and Sedition Act, which uh, basically suspended the uh, First Amendment of the Bill of Rights and made it illegal to criticize the government, either uh, with speech or in, in, in print. And he uh, sent a dozen journalists and one congressman to jail. Uh, for criticizing the government. So uh, there was growing tyranny in the federal government, and it's quite understandable because at the time, Congress really couldn't meet very often. Uh, Congre the congressmen lived far away. There were no highways, no, no public transportation of any time. It took days, weeks to get to Congress. So the president was left alone most of the time to run the government. Uh, Washington was the first one to seize uh, to usurp, in a sense, powers that were not granted to him under the Constitution. He sent troops to war against the Indians. He had no, no, power to, he had no constitutional power to send troops to war without the consent of Congress. Uh, the government ran out of money. He can't call Congress into session. He sent Alexander Hamilton to the local bank to borrow money. Uh, it, it, totally unconstitutional. Uh, similarly, the Alien Sedition Acts were unconstitutional. These men were left alone to try to run the government. Well, John Marshall, uh, when he saw uh, what Jefferson intended to do, uh, he said, enough. And as it, as it happened, John Marshall's appointment uh, was at the end of the Adams administration. And the, uh, Marshall advised Adams to really fill up every empty space in the ju federal judiciary with 
Federalists who believed in a strong central government uh, under the Constitution because he warned that Jefferson, a Republican, uh, was uh, enamored by the French Revolution, let the people run, run uh, the nation, and he feared anarchy. Adams did that. One of the men he appointed to a low level justice of the peace was a fellow named William Marbury, who became probably the most famous justice of the peace in American history. There was a famous case, which most of you probably remember, mentioned in the history books, Marbury v. Madison. Uh, Jefferson comes to power. Madison takes his office as Secretary of State, which was a much more powerful office in those days. And there are these commissions that had been signed and stamped with the seal of the United States uh, by the Adams administration. And they had to be delivered to these people who were named as judges and justices. Madison asked Jefferson, what, what should I do with these? And Jefferson <laughs> said, tear them up. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll name people to those posts. Well, Marbury sued uh, and demanded that the Supreme Court give him a writ of mandamus, which is a kind of a court order, forcing Madison to deliver him the commission. Jefferson dissolve, basically dissolves the Supreme Court. They don't meet. This was in, in 1801. They don't meet uh, for uh, eight years. And in, 17, uh, in 1808, they finally come together again and handle this Marbury v. Madison. And Marshall and the others come to a decision. Marshall writes a decision and says that um, both Madison and Jefferson have violated the Constitution. They cannot remove a judge. Under the Constitution, a ju federal judge can only be removed for, co for cause. He cannot be removed at the whim of the president. And the president is not above the law. And that shocked Jefferson. Jefferson thought the president was like the king, that he could do no wrong. Marshall said he can do wrong, and he has no, no power. No, he has no rights other than those of a citizen of the United States. So that was one part of this decision, uh, telling them they have to deliver the uh, commission to, uh, to Marbury. But he then finds against Marbury and says, I can't give you a writ of mandamus because you have to go through the lower courts and work your way up on appeal, and then I can give you a writ of mandamus. Uh, Marbury or his uh, attorney pull, pull out an obscure section of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which allows uh, demands for a writ of mandamus in from the Supreme Court in specific cases. Marshall turns around and says, well, that's unconstitutional. <laughs> uh, in New York City, we'd say, boy, what chutzpah. <laughs> he had no right to do that. Nothing in the Constitution gave him the right to declare a law, a, a law part of a law of Congress unconstitutional, but he did it. And today, to, to this day, it's called the, 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 the concept of judicial review. He created it. He invented it and gave the Supreme Court the power to review laws, uh, first federal laws, and declare them constitutional or unconstitutional. So that was the key part of, of uh, Marbury v. Madison. That gave the Supreme Court the first uh, power over the other two branches uh, throughout history, throughout history, each branch of government has violated the Constitution. And the violations are, are not, no one can arrest anybody and say, you can't violate the Constitution. The only way, reason we have a government, the only reason the Constitution survives is not because of the Constitution, it's because of when one, when one branch oversteps its, its mark, the other two branches tend to push back. So that if the president oversteps steps over the line, Congress uh, can uh, pass a law that prevents it from, uh, that prevents that first, uh, that prevents that act from taking effect. Uh, or they can actually bring him to trial. They can impeach him, and the Senate can try him for high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, if the court oversteps its bounds, Congress can pass a law that goes around uh, that decision, 
and basically nullifies it. And if Congress uh, oversteps its mark, the president can veto a law, and the Supreme Court can declare it unconstitutional. And this is what has held the, the, uh, our system together, not the, do, not the Constitution itself, because everybody in power in this nation, from small town sheriff in uh, Mississippi uh, to President Nixon, uh, to uh, Sam Rayburn, uh, everybody in power in this country has violated the Constitution or tried to do so in one way or another. And it's not the Constitution that stops them, it's the other, one of the other two branches. Uh, would you agree with that, Judge? I, well, I think that's, uh, that's a worthy insight. I, I suppose, I, I suppose I, I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to hear from you a, a bit about where Marshall came from, his family background, his, what, was his, um, what was the milieu under which he came up? Uh, well, like... Uh, many in power at that time, he came from Virginia. <laughs> uh, he was a farm boy in, a, in effect, but uh, a farm boy on hundreds of acres. Uh, his father, Thomas Marshall, was a good friend. They lived not far from the Washingtons and was a good friend of George Washington. And, the, and George Washington took Thomas Marshall out on surveying trips uh, where they uh, surveyed the lands of Lord Fairfax, uh, what's called the northern neck of Virginia, that, uh, a huge piece of land that juts out in Chesapeake Bay, was all owned by Lord For Fairfax uh, before the Revolution. And uh, Washington and, uh, and Marshall were favorites of him, and he sent them out to survey his land. After Virginia threatened to, Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia was going bankrupt, and it threatened to uh, seize lands that were, that were not lived in. Uh, so Fairfax quickly uh, saw to it that his lands were surveyed so that he could keep up uh, the, the, that property. Well, John Marshall was one of, uh, it was his first, it was Thomas Marshall's firstborn son, the oldest of 15 children, uh, all of whom survived, which was rare in those days. Uh, so as, as the, the oldest of this brood, uh, he became a surrogate leader, in a sense. Uh, he solved their arguments because the father was off surveying a lot of the time, and Thomas was the oldest, and became this wonderful negotiator of all these battles between his brothers and sisters. Uh, he then was, uh, he was educated by his father and mother at home as a youngster, and then sent to a school uh, uh, in the woods, a log cabin school, uh, quite a few miles away from, about a hundred miles away, and uh, he lived at the school. Parson Campbell uh, ran the school, and there was another boy in the school at the same time, uh, a little fellow named James Monroe. And uh, the two became close friends. Uh, Marshall would stay at, at the Monroe house occasionally, and they remained close friends to the end of their days truly close friends, even though politically at times they were on opposite sides of the fence as Monroe became a Republican, uh, Marshall became a Federalist. Uh, Marshall and Monroe went to war. Uh, 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 when Patrick Henry called them to war, they went to war as boys. Uh, they fought in, in the Battle of New York. They fought at Trenton. Uh, they fought at uh, Brandywine. And they were both at at uh, Valley Forge together for the winter and shared a log hut at Valley Forge together. The officers could share huts with each other. And so here they were, two heroes of the Revolutionary War uh, after Yorktown. Neither of them fought at Yorktown, not because they didn't want to, but because uh, officers had to recruit their own regiments, uh, their own companies. And uh, neither of them, uh, all the young Virginians had gone to war and they weren't going to go twice. They weren't going to do a second tour. And neither of them could recruit enough men to uh, fight at Yorktown, uh, which is why uh, it was so essential that uh, Rochambeau and the French armies uh, complement uh, Washington's uh, shrinking Continental Army at Yorktown. Afterwards, they both went to law school. Uh, Monroe studied under Jefferson at uh, Williamsburg, at, at William and Mary, 
and uh, Mon uh, Marshall uh, studied under Judge uh, White, who was a sig signatory of the Declaration of Independence. White being a Federalist, uh, Jefferson being a Republican. So they both learned different philosophies of the law uh, when they studied law. Marshall uh, decided to practice law. Oh, while he was there, he uh, married uh, his love of his life, Polly Ambler. Uh, the parents were friends of, of, of his parents. Polly was 14 years younger. Uh, they had 10 children together, uh, eight of whom survived, and lived a, a happy married life, truly a, 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 one of the warmest love stories to come out of the Revolutionary War, which, uh, and he was, Thomas Marshall was very, very happy. He loved being a father, loved being a husband, and loved practicing law at home. He really did not want to leave Richmond. They built a beautiful home there that's still there in Richmond. And uh, when Adams uh, came to power, uh, Adams asked uh, Marshall uh, to go to join a commission uh, that was to go to France to negotiate a, a peace with France. P France was shelling a lot of our ships on the, in the Caribbean, and uh, Adams hoped to, uh, to resolve this, the, these problems with France. When uh, Marshall came back from that, uh, uh, those treaty negotiations, uh, he was hailed as a hero uh, for having stood up for the interests of the United States he was elected to Congress, uh, and then in the last year of his administration, when uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice uh, had died, Adams had to appoint a new Chief Justice. Uh, this would have been the fourth Chief Justice. It was not a very important uh, position. Uh, the, the, the government had been in operation for 11 years. Over those 11 years, only 11 court decisions came out. So that's one decision a year. Remember, there weren't many laws on the books. And 95% of Americans were farmers. They were way out. Uh, they were too busy tilling the land to bring lawsuits. So it wasn't a very important job. And although Adams offered it to the original first Chief Justice, John Jay, John Jay refused. <laughs> he had done it once. He was bored silly, had resigned, and he wasn't going to go back to it. Uh, so Adams turns to Marshall and says, uh, whom should I appoint? And Marshall says, I don't have the slightest idea. And Adams says, I guess I'm going to have to appoint you. <laughs> and he did. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of a 35-year span, the longest span of any chief justice in American history the most decisions in American history, almost 1,200 decisions, of which he, John Marshall, wrote uh, nearly half. Uh, Republicans came and went, Federalists came and went, Whigs came and went, each with a political, each with a political agenda that the president who appointed them hoped they would stick to when they got on the court. When they got on the court, John Marshall t had this winning personality, turned them around, and they all became centrist moderates, and they dropped their political affiliations and, in, in effect, pledged uh, and acted uh, uh, in the interests of one thing only, the Constitution. Those of you who have been in the military know that the oath you take as you go in the military is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution you don't work for the American people. You don't work for a political party. You work for the Constitution, and that's what Marshall convinced his colleagues to do on the Supreme Court. And that's what makes the Supreme Court such a great institution, because it defends the Constitution. And most Americans think they have constitutional rights. They don't have any constitutional rights. The Constitution doesn't say a word about the people. The Constitution is a blueprint for government. It gives the government certain rights. And even in the Bill of Rights, the Tenth Amendment says that any powers that haven't been granted to the federal government are left to the states and the people, which is a formula for anarchy. But uh, 
Uh, nonetheless, that is the case. The Constitution doesn't give any of you any rights. It gives the government certain rights. And so the Supreme Court has been the defender of those constitutional rights and the expounder of those rights over the centuries. Now, have a lot of judges gotten on the court with political agendas? Yes. After Marshall died, his successor, Judge uh, Tawney, Justice Tawney, uh, uh, wrote the uh, Dred Scott decision, which declared all African Americans non-citizens with no rights to vote and no rights as citizens. Uh, uh, this current Supreme Court seems to be politically oriented to a great extent. So it happens, no question about it. But what the principles that Marshall established uh, was that once you're on the court, you, you, you work for the Constitution. And over the years, the Supreme Court has been a bulwark uh, to protect uh, the American people against tyranny, internal tyranny, by the executive and judiciary branches. When, uh, when President John Adams elevated Marshall to the chief justiceship, in his last, or one of his very last acts as president, the, uh, the incoming president, Thomas Jefferson, uh, had to be sworn in by a, uh, by a relative <laughs> whom he did not very much like. Oh, I they hated each other. Uh, perhaps you could uh, uh, tell our audience a little bit about the relationship between the two men and, uh, and, um, and about um, the course of their dealings over the years. Well, they, as I say, they had two different uh, diametrically opposed political philosophies. Uh, the one believing that uh, leave everything to the people, let them govern, govern as uh, the French did in the, in the French Revolution, which, as you all know, led to a bloodbath and eventual tyranny anyway. Uh, Marshall believed in a strong uh, central government uh, that uh, w with certain limits on its powers, but nonetheless a strong central government to handle the basic needs of the nation. Uh, they truly grew to despise each other uh, because Jefferson was constantly trying, uh, once he be became president, was constantly uh, violating the law and the, con and the Constitution. Uh, Jefferson was furious he hated to be crossed, and he was furious when Aaron Burr Jr. Uh, decided to challenge him before the, election, before the 1800 elections. Uh, Aaron Burr was really the uh, leader of the Republican Party in New York State. Without New York State, Jefferson would have lost to Adams. Adams would, had become a very popular president. And so uh, Aaron Burr agreed to try to deliver his state, New York, into the Republican camp, into Jefferson's camp. And he said, uh, if, I, if I do, I'll, I'll, be vice, I'll be happy to be vice president. Well, once he delivered those votes and it went into the Electoral College, lo and behold, uh, he won as many votes as Jefferson. It was a tie. They were both, both had the same number of votes for, for the presidency. And uh, uh, Burr's close friend, Governor Clinton of New York, said, uh, I'd fight Roger, for Roger, not Bill. Pardon? <laughs> not Bill. <laughs> yeah, no, not Bill. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd fight for it. You'd make a good president. And Aaron Burr was a very popular figure. He had been a, a, a tremendous hero in the Revolutionary War. Jefferson, remember, uh, he was being accused of cowardice at this point. And he, he you know, everything he did, uh, he would do uh, everything he said. He would do the opposite. He wrote, "All men are created equal," and he goes home to to run his plantation with two hundred slaves. Uh, he uh, right at the bottom of the Declaration of Independence, we pledge our our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. He never fired a shot. Other people who signed that document went out and fought. He went home to Charlottesville, never fired a shot. Stayed out of the war completely. So, uh, uh, and, and then when he was governor of, of Virginia, uh, Patrick Henry was the first governor and served three terms and under the Virginia Constitution, he could not succeed himself. So they elected uh, Jefferson 
And remember, the election is held by, by the uh, assembly, not by the people. The assembly named, uh, elected Jefferson governor. Washington warns Jefferson that uh, Benedict Arnold has become a, a, a general in the British Army and is going to lead a force up the James River and try to capture, Char uh, ca uh, capture uh, Richmond. Jefferson ignores him. He, he just does nothing. And what happens? Well, uh, the British sail up uh, the James River and burn the capital at Richmond, and Jefferson flees. Uh, at, towards the end of, the, of his first term, the assembly, under pa uh, Patrick Henry as one of the leaders, uh, was about to take a vote to censure Jefferson for his uh, really terrible leadership as governor. And just then word comes in of the victory at Yorktown. Well, everybody's slapping each other's back. They let it fall. Jefferson d says he won't run for a second term. And uh, they name uh, General Nelson as, as the new governor. Jefferson goes home to Monticello and everybody forgets about it for a while. Uh, so in, in 1800, when Burr is running uh, against Jefferson for the presidency. Burr is a very popular figure. And uh, finally, Alexander Hamilton, who hates Burr <laughs> as more than Jefferson does, uh, inveigles a few Federalists to change their vote. And after 36 <coughs> ballots in the House of Representatives, because if it was a tie in the Electoral College, the vote under the Constitution then was thrown in the House of Representatives, and they would vote. Well, they voted 36 times, and no one could get a majority. On the 36th ballot, Hamilton convinces a few Federalists to switch over to Jefferson. Jefferson wins. And is so bitter now at, Ar at Aaron Burr, he will not let Burr uh, loose. Burr becomes vice president. And Jefferson is plotting against him. Finally, Je uh, Burr and Hamilton have their famous duel. Uh, Burr kills Hamilton. Jefferson has uh, Republican uh, attorneys in New York and New Jersey uh, charge Burr with murder. Well, it wasn't murder. Dueling was perfectly legal in New Jersey. Uh, it was illegal in New York, but it didn't take place in New York. It took place in New Jersey. So uh, Burr flees uh, to escape New Jersey and uh, eventually comes back to Washington, to, uh, uh, Washington for the trial of, of uh, Justice Chase, who was being impeached. And the trial was in the Senate. Burr is still president of the Senate. He's still vice president. And he, he, he oversees that trial in a magnificent way. He was hailed as one of the, truly a great, great uh, judge uh, in, in that case. And afterwards, he then resigns because he knows he's, Jefferson's chasing him. And, and the Senate was in tears at the time uh, as he spoke and as he uh, tendered his resignation. He goes out west, and Jefferson won't let him alone. He sends troops after him. He, said, he, he has the commander of troops in the west suspend habeas corpus. Uh, Burr is brought between, uh, before one, then two, then three, then four grand juries. Each time, the grand juries throw the, ca throw the case out. Uh, finally, uh, troops capture him in Alabama and bring him to trial in Richmond uh, for treason. Guess who the circuit judge is? It's John Marshall. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, they hear the case, they hear the evidence, there's absolutely not a shred of evidence against Burr. And Marshall throws the case out, uh, and, and Jefferson hated him for that. Uh, Burr, of course, uh, Jefferson had a lot of friends everywhere in the South. Uh, Burr was fearful of his life and fled uh, to Europe, uh, lived in Europe for, uh, until Jefferson's administration came to an end. Uh, then came back, and uh, his, his uh, wife and son were still in this country. And uh, the boy had died shortly before he arrived. And the wife, 
Theodosia gets on a ship, she was in the South, to meet him in New York, and the ship was never heard from ever again. Uh, he lived out the rest of his life practicing law in New York, uh, quietly, at uh, substantial law practice, uh, but Jefferson is responsible for destroying this man's life and costing America a great, a great American hero. So uh, he hated Marshall for ruling against him in uh, the United States v. Burr. Uh, but again, there was not a shred of evidence, and Marshall did the right thing. Footnote, uh, it was George Clinton. Roger's a brother, a half-brother of Bill. Uh, my, my bad. Uh, so several events, several events um, uh, uh, of great importance in your book occurred right here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and um, in your book, you talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, and then, of course, all of the events um, related to the, um, the capital city of our young nation uh, early on. And I wonder if you could tell the audience uh, a little bit about Marshall's role uh, in some of these Pennsylvania-centered events. Well, the, uh, the Whiskey Rebellion was, uh, uh, again, one of these instances where uh, the, the American people had not really accepted uh, the concept of a, of a national uh, union of a real country. When people said my country in those days, uh, they meant uh, Virginia or Pennsylvania. Uh, they didn't mean the United States. Uh, during, the second, during the Second World War, uh, that's George Marshall. Uh, <laughs> uh, during the Revolutionary War, each of, these, each of the colonies uh, had declared independence from Britain. Uh, they didn't declare they were united as a people. They declared independence, and they were independent nations. Uh, they all joined into this very loose-knit confederation and signed a document called the Articles. Well, actually, they didn't sign it until quite a few years later, but they drew up a, a, a thing called the Articles of Confederation, in which they sent representatives to what we now call the Continental Congress. And it was really to discuss common issues and try to agree on how they're going to conduct the war uh, together, how they're going to cooperate. Well, they didn't cooperate. Uh, Washington, after a while, couldn't get, Congress didn't have the right to tax, so it couldn't send any money for the Continental Army. And Washington, uh, by 1777, at Valley Forge, uh, he, his people are dying at Valley Forge, they're starving, they're freezing to death, he has no money. Uh, his army at one point had deteriorated by desertions uh, from over 13,000 to down to 3,500 men. Uh, the war was over. Uh, the, the, the con Congress even left Philadelphia and fled to Baltimore. Uh, and, and then uh, after the, the, the British took Philadelphia, the capital, they fled westward and when Congress left Philadelphia, it had more than 50 members. By the time it arrived in York, Pennsylvania, where they tried to, where they did establish the Congress again, there were only 21 members left. They had all fled for their homes. Uh, they, they were sure that the British were going to win, and they wanted to protect their families and figure out how they could escape arrest for treason, because this was still officially Brit uh, British territory. Uh, so, this was not a union by any means uh, during the Revolutionary War. And after the war was over, after the Battle of Yorktown, uh, they did then sign the Articles of Confederation, but it left Congress with no powers. They still couldn't raise taxes. They couldn't raise an army if they needed to. Uh, it had no federal powers. And as in Western Europe, uh, all of these independent states started fighting with each other. Uh, Vermont and New York and uh, Massachusetts really started battling each other with guns uh, at the front, at the boundary where the th three states meet uh, over, over that territory. Uh, a group of Connecticut farmers who tried to settle in northwestern Pennsylvania, what's called the Wyoming Valley, has nothing to do with Wyoming, the, the river there was called the Wyoming River, uh, were fired upon by Pennsylvania militia. Uh, these were foreigners from Connecticut. They didn't, Pennsylvania didn't want them there. Uh, so 
when eventually they, they sign a constitution and create this union of 13 states, of 11 states, only 11 states signed the constitution at first, uh, the, average, the average person, when he said my country, he meant uh, Virginia or, or Delaware or the state he came from. And uh, each state and the people of each state still felt they, that their state was supreme. And this battle over st what we now call states' rights still goes on. Uh, they call it state sovereignty. And this is one of the great uh, elements of the early Marshall decisions was to try to crush this concept of state sovereignty. Uh, Jefferson himself uh, basically committed treason as vice president, uh, writing up uh, what's called the Kentucky Resolution, which uh, asked Kentucky legislature, le legislators to deem unconstitutional any law, any federal law they didn't like. Well, that in itself, that, that breaks up the union. And uh, Jeff Jefferson set off this, this states' rights uh, fight that continue, continued right in, in our lifetime, in the days of George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. But to get back to the Whiskey Rebellion, these were West, uh, uh, farmers in Western Virginia. Uh, the federal government had passed a tax uh, under when Alexander Hamilton uh, was vice president, uh, was uh, secretary of treasury, the federal government had passed a law uh, taxing uh, st uh, stills. It was a whiskey tax. Well, in western Pennsylvania, every farmer had a still. That's the only way he could make money. Uh, the Appalachians were un uh, impassable. You couldn't, you couldn't ca grow corn or wheat, pack it on wagons, and get it across the Appalachians to eastern markets. There was no way, no way to transport it. There were no roads. So what they did was they distilled it in liquor and put it in bottles and, and jugs and, uh, and barrels. That they could put on mule back and carry across uh, the, uh, the mountains. So a tax on, the, on, on stills wiped out their profits. It was a 15% tax, and that, that was basically what, what they sold their, their whiskey for. And they rebelled. Uh, they uh, uh, burned down the house of the tax collector, lynched a few tax collectors, and were threatening to march on, on Philadelphia, which was then the national ca temporary national capital. During the entire Washington administration and most of the Adams administration, Philadelphia uh, was the capital. Um, not during the entire, the first capital was New York for a couple of years and then moved to Philadelphia. Um, but they were threatening to march to Philadelphia and Washington, again, uh, usurped, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, pulled together, a, 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 called the militia out from uh, Pennsylvania, several other states, put together an army of 13,000 men. Congress didn't vote on it. Uh, thir a little over 13,000 men named Alexander Hamilton, his aide from the war, as uh, uh, inspector general. Washington himself was going to lead the army against the rebels. Uh, and he went up in the attic, uh, according to Martha, and got his uniform out and wouldn't fit. <laughs> so he had a tailor come and, and, and outfit him out with a new uniform. And uh, the story, the, the written story is that he uh, had trouble getting on to uh, his horse. Uh, the, probably the truth is that the uniform split. <laughs> but whatever happened, he finally decides to go in a carriage with Alexander Hamilton to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where the army was gathering. And all the old uh, boys from war, all the old generals were all there. They were all called back into action. They're all old men now. And there, there's Morgan, who re led the Morgan Rifleman at Saratoga. Uh, General Green is there. He's come up from South Carolina. He's had been running a plantation. Uh, they're all there, Richard Henry Lee. And uh, 
they convince Washington that he's too valuable as president, that if, some, if he was shot or killed or uh, injured in any way, the, the nation would lose the, the man who was holding them together. Uh, as Jefferson had put it uh, when con trying to convince him to run a second term, uh, the, the North and South will only hang together if they have you to hang on. So they convinced Washington to go, go back to Philadelphia, go back home, and let uh, uh, Richard Henry Lee, who had seniority, run the, run the army. Uh, he agreed to uh, name Hamilton Inspector General, because Hamilton was younger than all of them. And so it was Hamilton really uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the leadership role. And they march out to uh, the suburbs of what is now Pittsburgh. And uh, they get there onto what is, was called Braddock's Field. It was where General Braddock and his men had been slaughtered by in, French and Indians uh, in, in the colonial days. And they find nobody. <laughs> All the farmers have left. Uh, they didn't have the wherewithal to fight an army. And they, they, they scour the woods around Braddock's Field and they find uh, 15 or 20 drunks. <laughs> And they bring them back to Philadelphia and march them down Market Street uh, in, in, in wooden carts. And there was no cheering. Everybody just st watched this uh, army go by, uh, absolutely stunned uh, by the brutality of, of, of the whole uh, operation. Uh, these people had uh, Washington at actually thrown the Constitution to the winds because these people had simply uh, organized uh, for a redress of grievance, uh, which, is, which is their constitutional right, and, uh, or which is their right under the Constitution. I said it the wrong way. Uh, and eventually, uh, Washington grants amnesty uh, to 18 of the 20 and the other two he issued pardons to. So no one ever went to jail because of the Whiskey Rebellion. But it was, it was a, a, a clear case of uh, institutional, in this case the executive, institutional usurpation of powers and the kind of tyranny uh, any one of our branches of government can exercise without the checks and balances of the other two branches. This was during the Washington administration. The, the Supreme Court had no power of any kind. Uh, the Congress only met twice a year for a few weeks at a time and really didn't uh, exert its power under the Constitution. Uh, it, it, it was not until uh, after Jefferson's administration, when Jefferson had been weakened, uh, that a a, 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 a wonderful young congressman was elected from the state of Kentucky, uh, Henry Clay. Uh, and he came into the House of Representatives and or, organized it into the House we know today. He, he took over the uh, job as Speaker of the House, uh, slammed his gavel down, surrounded himself with other young men who were tired of this anarchy that was going on, and reminded the, pe the members of the House and the rest of the American people, that the Constitution begins, we the people of the United States. And the House of Representatives was the elect of the elect. It was their Constitution. They had written it, and they were there to govern the nation. And he, he rebuilt the House of Representatives and, and eventually uh, the Senate as well. He went into the Senate later on. And uh, I should, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, just mention that uh, my book on Henry Clay is coming out next year. <laughs> I have so many things to ask you, but uh, our audience um, takes precedence, so I'll turn to some of our audience questions. Mr. Unger, uh, we have a question. Can you talk about John Marshall's leadership? How was he able to build consensus so well on the court do you think that can be done on the modern court? Well, I, I think it could be done on the modern court, but I don't. I, I, I really don't know. You know, all of us have known uh, a friend or someone at work who has this knack of uh, people just 
gather around him or her. Uh, they're able to win friends. Uh, remember there's this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Some people have that gift, and John Marshall obviously had that gift, and it's interesting. Uh, uh, the the uh, executive editor of my publisher, Robert Pigeon, is in the audience, and uh, he and I were discussing this at lunch, that we really, except for the letters, we really don't know how, what, did, what language they used in conversing with each other. For one thing, they spent a great deal more time together, not just within the bounds of the court, Absolutely. but in their lodgings, for example. And, uh, Marshall convinced, first of all, the court was kind of isolated in Washington. None of the congressmen wanted anything to do with them because their, their case might come up before these justices. So uh, they were kind of isolated, and uh, Washington was a horrible town then, uh, these terrible ramshackle boarding houses. Marshall got the members of the court uh, to all live at the same boarding house, have breakfast and dinner together and lunch together, and, and discuss life as well as their decisions together in the house. And he managed to convince people to become moderate uh, and to always to focus on the Constitution as the primary reason for their being there. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, he was known for his sloppy dress when he got home. And uh, he was walking down, uh, and, and his wife became rather an invalid uh, after a couple of miscarriages. So he started doing the, walking in the market and doing some of the shopping. And uh, he was dressed like a slob one day, and uh, a young, well-dressed dandy who didn't know who Marshall was, uh, comes up and uh, he's got a heavy turkey. He said, would you mind carrying this turkey for me? I'll give you a half dollar. Marshall takes a turkey, follows the guy who's home, takes a half dollar and, and, and leaves. <laughs> that, that may be a warning for Chief Justice John Roberts to dress well when he goes to the Eastern Market. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the type of fellow he was. And he, he had been a farm boy, you know, if mo most of these people uh, who had grown up on farms uh, loved farming. Uh, farming had a sense of uh, a sense of person uh, ness to it. It's, it. it's my land, and I've made, with God's help, I've made these seeds grow into uh, fruit and vegetables and edibles. Uh, they loved the land. Washington loved the land. Uh, when he toured the United States to get to know the people and let the people know him. That was one of the things. Washington was a, quite a stately man, but he wanted the people to know him. And he knew the only thing they could see was a portrait. And that wasn't enough. He wanted them to see him in person. And he toured New England. and He'd stop at every farm, walk the fields with the farmer, pick up some dirt, sniff it, rub it together. You know. And he knew the soil. He knew what good soil was like. And so did Marshall. And, and these were truly. Uh, to, to be trite, down-to-earth people. <laughs> well, he, even John Adams, as this uh, well, brilliantly educated, sophisticated Harvard uh, lawyer, uh, was a farmer. He grew up on a, a small farm. Uh, in fact, he and, and, and Washington the, at the uh, Continental Congress, uh, people thought they were arguing with each other because John Adams used to snap his head. He had an ugly expression. He was talking, talk, I, I, you know, like a New England. And uh, when they got close to the conversation, it turned out they were discussing farming. And Adams did not understand how you, you ran a 20,000-acre farm. And Washington did not understand how you could make a profit out of a 40-acre farm. <laughs> well, the 20,000-acre the farm uh, comment uh, brings up one of our audience's other questions. What was Marshall's uh, view on slavery? Uh, he uh, had uh, a handful of slaves. Uh, most of the time, they, they, they lived in a house in Richmond. So the, the slaves they had were um, uh, household slaves. And uh, when Polly, his wife, uh, got sicker and sicker, and suddenly he had to uh, travel more on the circuit, his head slave uh, was this flamboyant uh, <laughs> A black man dressed in these very, uh, uh, the kinds of clothes you see in the Mardi Gras. And um, Marshall thought it was very cute and, and liked uh, the young man 
Uh, actually, he hadn't bought, a uh, young man's name was Spurlock. He hadn't bought Spurlock. Uh, it was a wedding gift. So he never had the sense that uh, Spurlock was his property. And Spurlock uh, would speak up, and Spurlock was allowed to go out. And little by little, Spurlock became a, a leader among the black slaves in, uh, in Richmond and would come back and tell Marshall uh, about some injustice. And Marshall went out and, and defended slaves in, in, in many cases. But one of the major problems uh, that happened in these cities like Richmond in the South uh, was intermarriage between slaves and non-slaves. And what were the children then? Were they slaves or not? Um, and Marshall fought uh, for passage of the law that declared uh, uh, the children born of one free parent are uh, children are free. Uh, the same thing. There had been a law passed be, uh, to that children born of a marriage between an, an American Indian, a Native American, and uh, a slave, an African American slave, was free, was basically an Indian. But that ha had not been the case between. Uh, a free African-American and an enslaved African-American. Uh, so Marshall was responsible, but the person who was really responsible was Spurlock. So they had a wonderful relation. Spurlock stayed with him all his life and uh, then with uh, uh, one of his children. John Marshall could not have imagined the Twitterverse, but we do have a question from the Twitterverse. And it follows. This morning, Chief Justice John Roberts quoted John Marshall in holding that the Fourth Amendment permits reasonable mistakes of law by the police. That's from U.S. versus Riddle in 1809. Uh, what reactions uh, do you have to that, and how, how, if at all, did the Fourth Amendment evolve under John Marshall? Uh, well, I would disagree with Ju Justice Roberts on, on that decision, because it was an, a no decision. Uh, they did not hear the case. They turned it down. They said it was not a... A uh, constitutional matter. Uh, I think uh, John Marshall, uh, everything I've read and studied about John, John Marshall is, uh, he shows him to have been one of the most, uh, the fairest uh, judge in American history. So I don't remember that's the details of that specific case, but uh, he would, n he would not, never have sided with any case of police brutality, of, of uh, unnecessary police brutality. Certainly, uh, if the policeman is under assault, uh, he would then <clears throat> side with the policeman's right to defend himself. Everybody's heard of the Trail of Tears, and I wonder if you could uh, tell the audience um, maybe in the time remaining, uh, something about uh, Marshall's role uh, in the litigation from Georgia with the Cherokee Nation. Yeah, this was one of the uh, uh, most important cases in uh, Marshall's uh, 1,200 cases. Uh, it's called Worcester v. Georgia. Uh, they discovered uh, George Washington had set up a treaty with the Cherokees in the South uh, to try to teach them, and he sent missionaries throughout the South to teach them to become farmers and uh, to live like uh, Americans. And they agreed. Uh, and so their lands in the South were, some of them were absolutely flourishing plantations. And then someone discovered some gold, gold flakes. Uh, George's legislature seized all the lands, uh, dissolved the Cherokee Nation, declared Cherokee laws invalid, uh, and sent 150,000 uh, Native Americans into exile. And they traveled along this Trail of Tears, it's called, across the Mississippi River, eventually settling in Oklahoma. 60,000 died along the way. It's the worst case of genocide uh, imaginable in, in history at that time. The Inquisition only cost 10,000 lives, Spanish Inquisition. Uh, the French Revolution with all the butchery and the gu guillotines we're about, 
uh, only about 2,500, 3,000 lives. Highest estimates, 5,000. 60,000 Native Americans died of starvation uh, and exposure on this trail of tears. Well, now this land is, uh, belongs to Georgia, and Georgia, speculators come in and, and buy land. They bribe the Georgia legislatures, uh, legislators to, uh, f to buy the land, uh, and uh, one of them, a fellow uh, named Peck, resells the land that he bought from Georgia to uh, a fellow named Fletcher. And uh, then a new legislator, legislature comes in and throws that uh, out. And uh, Fletcher wants his money back. Uh, the Supreme Court rules in his favor, saying that, uh, uh, he's, that, that the, uh, the, the previous decision had violated the contract. And that was in a case called Fletcher v. Peck. In the case of Worcester v. Georgia, uh, after the Cherokee Indians are moved out along the Trail of Tears, uh, a, a, a Reverend Samuel Worcester, who was preaching among the Indians, uh, protested and was arrested by the state of Georgia for violating what they now call the Cherokee laws. Uh, he happened also to have been a federal postmaster. So he brought suit. And now the federal government can step in to the case. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled against Georgia uh, saying that they had violated Samuel Worcester's rights uh, and, and that the Cherokee laws of Georgia were unconstitutional. At first, Andrew Jackson was president then. At first, Jackson, who hated the Supreme Court, was more of a, of a, of a Republican than Jefferson. First, Jackson said, uh, Mar John Marshall has made his decision. Let him enforce it. Well, then the Georgia militia, Georgia governor calls up the militia to uh, defend the state of Georgia against any possible incursion by the federal government uh, in this Cherokee case. And now Jackson has to act, and he turns uh, uh, right around and warns Georgia that he will send federal troops, and he actually called out federal troops to go down and confront uh, Georgia. Georgia pulled back and agreed to let Samuel Worcester, to free Samuel Worcester. But that set the first precedent uh, of federal troops enforcing a federal uh, a Supreme Court uh, decision. And it was a precedent that uh, fortunately hadn't been we haven't had to use often, but uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, of course, used that precedent in sending troops to Little Rock, Arkansas to uh, enforce the Supreme Court decision on school desegregation. And now CEO Rosen, in turn, is enforcing the time limit, so. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, like the Sixth Amendment right to speedy trial, uh, <laughs> National Constitution Center book fairs have to end on time. But I just have to thank First of all, our two superb participants, Harlow Unger and Judge Weck, for a spectacular conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining in what turned out to be a glorious experiment. We did not know what would happen when we asked the leading authors on the left and the right and everywhere in between to talk about the Constitution for four hours on Bill of Rights Day but what happened was conversations of such substance and such uh, weight and such illumination that I think all of us feel uh, smarter and better educated about the Bill of Rights than before. And it's a tribute to you that you joined us, a tribute to our great C-SPAN audience that you're part of this as well, and a vindication of my faith that when the citizens of the United States are presented with the best arguments on all sides of complicated constitutional questions, they can pay attention and grasp them and make up their own minds. It is such a privilege to share Bill of Rights Day with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. 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 Thanks.